Let's take a look now at section 5 of chapter 4 of the GDPR and this deals with the codes of conduct and certification. So there was some mention of these in earlier sections. The codes of conduct and certification have not really been very well developed yet. It's, it's still early days for those. And so much of what's in this section is aspirational. But it does make a lot of sense. And so the GDPR tries to promote the development and adoption of codes of conduct. So standard ways of doing things that people would sign up for. And then also certification procedures where people can demonstrate through certification that they are implementing good data protection practices. Article 40 states that the member states, the supervisory authorities and the board and the commission shall encourage the drawing up of codes of conduct intended to contribute to the proper application of this regulation taking into account the specific features of the various processing sectors and the specific needs of micro, small and medium-sized enterprises. So I mentioned an example earlier of a professional body representing dry cleaners. And they might look at the kinds of data that dry cleaners process, the kinds of IT systems that they might need, the kinds of things they might like to be doing, and then, as an organisation, come up with a code of conduct for dry cleaners in Ireland. And then members of the Dry Cleaning Association could sign up to this, and then they know they'd be good to go, you know. Every dry cleaner wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel to be compliant with the GDPR. So associations and other bodies representing categories of controllers or processors may prepare codes of conduct for the purpose of specifying the application of this regulation. And then there's a list of things that these codes of conduct could go into. So the fair and transparent processing, the legitimate interests pursued by the controllers, the collection of personal data, the pseudonymization of personal data, the information provided to the public and data subjects, and the exercise of the rights of data subjects. It would also go into the information provided to and the protection of children and the way in which um, parental consent could be obtained. Although I think, as we found, a lot of people don't even want to go near this. It could specify measures and procedures referred to in Article 24 and 25. Those are about the responsibility of the controller and data protection by design and by default. And also the security measures specified in Article 32. It could go into details about the notification of personal data breaches to the supervisory authority and the communication to the data subjects. This off-the-shelf code of conduct could deal with the transfer of personal data to third countries. That's something we're going to look at. And it could even refer to out-of-court proceedings and other dispute resolution procedures that might be available between controllers and data subjects. So the professional body could commission this work and then that could be an off-the-shelf GDPR data protection strategy and plan ready to go provided to people in the specific industry sector. And of course, it's going to vary from sector to sector. We can see in Article 44, however, that a, a code of conduct is useless if there's no mechanisms for the monitoring of it. I mean, if it's just sitting in a ring binder, not being implemented, then it's of no value. So Article 45 then discusses the involvement of the supervisory authority in approving these codes of conduct. So to take the Association of Dry Cleaners example again, the code could be developed and then this would be submitted to the supervisory authority and the supervisory authority would give its opinion and could uh, approve it or suggest amendments. And where such a code is approved then, Article 46, 
provides for the publication by the supervisory authority of that code of conduct. So if you're in the business of developing these codes of conduct, unfortunately, you might find that someone could just copy and paste the brilliant one you did. Article 41 specifies then the way in which the approved code of conduct will be monitored. And there are some fairly detailed provisions there. You can read those. It is fair to say, though, that codes of conduct haven't really taken off massively just yet. Article 41.4 then provides a provision to suspend or exclude people from the code. So if there is a dry cleaner that is obviously not abiding by the code of conduct, well then they can be booted out of the scheme. And of course, if the scheme isn't properly policed, the supervisory authority can revoke the accreditation for the code of conduct altogether. Article 41.6 specifies that Article 41 does not apply to processing carried out by public authorities. So the code of conduct umbrella is not available to public authorities. But of course, that doesn't stop public authorities that are in similar kinds of business getting together and sharing resources and sharing expertise and coming up with a standard template. But it does mean that the data processing provisions and plans and mechanisms in place will each be evaluated independently and must stand up independently. But there's no reason, for example, why the different regional health boards wouldn't get together and come up with a fairly standard way of doing things. There's no reason why the universities of Ireland shouldn't come together and figure out best practice between them. There's nothing stopping local authorities cooperating on the best way to do things. GDPR Article 42 then provides for a more formal system where there is a certification process. So there are a few products we could think of where before buying them, you would check that they meet a certain standard. And often there's a, a logo or some sort of certification. Fair Trade Coffee comes to mind, for example, or Rainforest Alliance products. So there are already in existence certification schemes for products that can give people a competitive edge in the market if they meet certain standards. And so these schemes set out standards that companies have to meet. If they meet the standards, they can subscribe to the scheme and use the certification on their products. The framers of the GDPR imagined a similar provision for digital services where customers could check for certification. So you might be going to a website to buy something and see that the data processing practices of that business have been certified as being compliant and there might be some shiny, happy GDPR mascot or something or some official-looking GDPR wax seal. So the GDPR provides for these certification schemes and these are accredited by the supervisory authorities. So again, this could be an interesting business opportunity even for someone, although it is fair to say uh, it hasn't really taken off. I haven't seen many examples of this in the marketplace, but maybe it's just a matter of time. It's very clear that some businesses make a virtue of their data protection policies and it does give them an edge in the marketplace. It's very clear, for example, that Apple enjoys a competitive edge in the marketplace because its products are known to be secure and it's known that its data protection policies are perhaps better than some of its competitors. Article 42.5 provides for a European data protection seal. So this is something that might be approved on an EU-wide basis. 
So you recall a few years ago, everyone was going on about ISO 9000. You can imagine a certification process for your data protection procedures and policies. And lots of companies might be striving to get this certification so that they can let their customers know how great they are. This hasn't really come to pass just yet, but the GDPR is a forward-looking document. It's not just about the here and now. It's projecting into the future, and we may see this in the future. Article 43 then deals with these certification bodies and how they might work. There's a lot of detail in there, but as you can see, as we get further and further along into the GDPR, we get involved in higher and higher levels of abstraction and we move further away from the data subject and it gets more meta. So in summary then, there's a lot going on in Chapter 4 of the GDPR. It specifies the obligations of the data controller and the data processor. It specifies the nature of the relationship between them and importantly, who's on the hook if something goes horribly wrong. It also specifies a lot of the obligations of the controller and the processor to keep proper documentation. And it sets out very specific requirements and very specific things that have to happen in the event of a data breach. It's very clear that if there's a data breach sweeping it under the rug and pretending it didn't happen isn't an option. This chapter of the GDPR also specifies the role of the data protection officer. And the data protection officer keeps coming up throughout the GDPR. And it specifies the role of the data protection officer and in some respects provides a, a job description for that role. And then finally, as we've just seen, it also specifies some codes of conduct and certification that can be used to make meeting the obligations easier and also demonstrating that they've been met. But such things are still very much works in progress. Next up, we'll look at what happens if you want to do processing outside of the EU.